Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another FJMC sports webinar. And along with my fabulous co-chairman, David Kravitz, from the Holy Land of Worcester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. we welcome you to uh, what's going to be a very, very special evening. Um, <clears throat> Dan Grunfeld is our host, and Dan just released his book, so uh, we, our timing is impeccable by the grace of the game. So uh, Dan is a former professional basketball player, um, and he's also the son of Ernie Grunfeld, also a professional basketball player, um, and then former GM of the Knicks, the Bucks, and the Wizards. But most importantly, and what this book is all about, is Dan is a grandson of someone who went through the Shoah. And his story, I actually was privileged enough, Dan was nice enough to send me a digital copy before the uh, book actually came out. So I'm pretty much halfway through. It's very poignant, it's very personal. So this is not just a sports webinar tonight. This is a personal story. And without any further ado, what, a couple, just a couple of things before I do hand it over to Dan. Please, 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 please. We have muted you. Please do not unmute yourself. Any and all questions, and we encourage you to ask as many as you would like, please put them through the chat. And then Dan will either answer them as he speaks, or we will certainly have time at the end of this to give Dan those questions. So feel free. And again, on behalf of Dave Kravitz and myself, we thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have a big turnout. We're up to uh, 50 uh, participants already and more are coming in. So we're very, very excited. And Dan, take it away. I'll take it away. Danny, thank you so much for that warm introduction. And Tom, thank you, you can to... un, uh, unspotlight me. Thank you, Tom. Thank you to Dave for having me. I just want to reiterate, ask questions. Uh, you know, I like my presentations to be conversational. So as I'm speaking, if I hit on something that is interesting to someone here or you want to learn more, please drop it into the chat. And Danny, I'll ask you to kind of be my spotter, you know, while I'm talking. And if you see questions arise, please unmute yourself and ask them because that's what makes this whole thing fun. And so my plan is to speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, hopefully with some questions, but then we'll just build in time at the end to have more of a dialogue and to answer those specific questions. So really, really grateful for you all taking the time to learn about my story to, today. Again, thank you, Danny, for your leadership in setting this up. So as Danny mentioned, my name is Dan Grunfeld. I'm a former professional basketball player. I played collegiately at Stanford and I come from a basketball family. You know, my dad, Ernie, is very well known in the game of basketball, you know, was a legend in, in high school, was a legend in college, was a solid NBA player, not, not, a, uh, not a superstar like he was at those other levels, but you know, he had a 30 year career as an NBA executive. So very well known person in basketball and in sports, but what is less well known is that he's the only player in NBA history whose parents survived the Holocaust. And it was both of his parents are survivors, both of my grandparents. And the research suggests that he's the only player in the history of major American sports whose parents survived the Holocaust. Uh, that is a fact that I uncovered doing my research. It's not a metric that people track, right? Analytics is very big in sports nowadays, but people aren't tracking that you know, the, the son of survivors to play in one of the, the four major American sports leagues. But if you think about what it takes to get from the Shoah to the NBA, you know, it, it's a pretty remarkable journey. And so it, it's one that I always wanted to tell. Uh, I did a year and a half of research uh, to kind of learn my family's history. I wrote for several years. So all in all, it's been over more than a five year process. And my book was released on Tuesday. So you're talking to me roughly 48 hours after this story that I poured my heart and soul into is released to the world. And I'm proud that it's the number one spot on Amazon for new releases in its category. Uh, it's sold out uh, in many retailers, which is a good thing, but also, you know, it, it's a little bit of a delay. But if you're interested in reading the book, please place the order because they're, they're going to ship soon. But uh, so let me tell you a bit about, about the story. It really starts with my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother has a very big story with the Holocaust. So she is from Transylvania on the border of Romania and Hungary. And uh, you'll all be happy to know that she's 96 years old today. She lives in the Bay Area, 25 minutes away from me and my wife. 
She still cooks us these amazing meals. She plays bridge five times a week. So I always tell people, you want to eat my grandmother's cooking. You don't want to play cards against her. And that's the truth. She's the most amazing person. And when I played collegially at Stanford, she came to every single home game I played. She picked up my dirty laundry on Sundays, dropped off my clean laundry, stocked our fridge. Uh, she, she, my grandma's always treated me very well. She would even clean my roommates' rooms. And I would, I call her Anyu, which means mother in Hungarian. I would say, Anyu, you don't have to clean their rooms. And she would say, if, she calls me Tatala. And she would say, if my Tatala lives here, it has to be clean. So, you know, she's had a really profound impact on my life. Uh, again, grew up in Transylvania on the border of Romania and Hungary, Orthodox Jewish family, parents. There were 10, 10 of them. So she had nine siblings. And by all accounts, her childhood was idyllic. You know, they didn't have technology. They grew up kind of in a rural on a farm, but they had a lot of laughter, a lot of joy, a lot of love. And that all changed when the Nazis invaded. Um, my grandmother happened to be visiting her sister in Budapest at that time. And when the Nazis invaded, she got a letter from my great grandfather that said, come home immediately. She, he sensed, you know, the, the danger. And so my grandma and her sister started to pack their suitcases. They had a plan to go to the train station. The next day, right before they were set to leave for the train station, they got another letter from their father that said, if you can stay where you are. That's all it said. And uh, my grandma says to this day, it was that letter that saved her from Auschwitz. And that was the last communication she ever had with her father, who was her hero. And uh, his name was Solomon Samuel. I have a two and a half year, a year old son at home. His name is Solomon after my great grandfather. And so my grandma was had a chance to survive on the run in Budapest. And so if, if some of you or maybe all of you are familiar with Holocaust history, you've likely heard of Swedish diplomat Raoul Wallenberg. The street outside of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. is Raoul Wallenberg Way. He's regarded as to be one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust, saving some estimates 100,000 Jews. Uh, my grandmother was one of them. And so he issued pr protective passports for Jews in Budapest. And so my grandma was, was able to obtain one of these passports, which gave her s some protection. And uh, not only did she get one for herself, she risked her life to obtain 17 others for other people who needed it. So I always tell people, my grandmother is my hero, but she is also a hero. She really did risk her life to save others. At a certain point in time, that Schutz passes, that's a Wallenberg issue, they were called Schutz passes. It was no longer valid because there was a change of government. And so my grandma was apprehended by the Nazis. She was thrown in jail. And then she was placed in the Budapest ghetto, which was a few city blocks uh, in Budapest, where Jews were kind of caged and corralled, kind of awaiting further action. And the Nazis stayed out of the ghetto. And my grandmother actually was reunited with her brother in the ghetto who had been in a labor camp. And so she she had a sibling in there. At the end of the war, one day, my grandmother and her brother saw 20 Nazis come into the Budapest ghetto with machine guns over their shoulders. And uh, Word quickly spread that they were there to kill the remaining 80,000 Jews in the Budapest ghetto. And so my grandmother and her brother ran up there, the stairs of uh, their building. They found an attic space where they hid. And my grandma describes it as it was the size, it could fit roughly four or five people comfortably. And there were about a dozen scared people in there fighting for their life. And so my grandma, they, she waited five minutes and then 20 minutes and then an hour and nothing happened. And eventually they had someone who was hiding in the attic with them go check what was happening. And the ghetto was clear. The Nazis had left. Soon Romanian and Russian soldiers came in and they were liberated. And so that's how my grandmother survived the Holocaust. She, she never, she didn't know why the Nazis left the ghetto that day. That was 1945. So 40 years later, my grandmother now had fled communism, immigrated to the United States, was living in the Bay Area. My dad was a big basketball star. And there was a movie made about Raoul Wallenberg's life and Richard Chamberlain played Wallenberg. And so my grandmother, of course, had the date circled on her calendar because Wallenberg had saved her during the war. She knew that. And so as she watched the movie towards the end, you see the Budapest ghetto and you see an order from Adolf Eichmann to, to kill the remaining 80,000 Jews in the ghetto. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg gets in his car, races to the gates of the ghetto, jumps out, confronts the general, the only person who had the power to stop it. And Wallenberg begged and pleaded, and he said, the war is over. You will hang for this. And he was able to convince the general to call off the massacre. And then the Nazis left the ghetto and never came back. And so 
it took my grandmother 40 years to learn that Raoul Wallenberg saved her life not once, but twice during the war. And so he's always been a big symbol in my family because he wasn't Jewish. You know, he was just someone who stood up for what was right. And he risked his life and he ultimately lost his life to protect others. He was apprehended by the Russians after the war and was never seen again. And I visited the Holocaust Museum with my grandma several years ago. And she said to me, before we see anything, there's something I want you to see. And so we walked to a place in the, in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. called Wallenberg's Corner. And it's a, it's a little bit of a, a memorial to him. And we just stood and we, we read about Wallenberg. And she told me, I want you to remember that this is here and I want your kids to remember this is here. And so whenever I think about heroism and what a real hero is, I think about Raoul Wallenberg. And so when my grandmother got back to her childhood home, which as I mentioned, two parents, 10 kids, it was always bustling, always a lot of laughter, a lot of commotion. It was empty, no people. The house, the house had been ransacked and looted. There was a farm, there were animals, everything decimated, everything gone. And so my grandma didn't know what happened. You know, they were totally, totally in the dark. Uh, so she would soon learn that both of her parents were killed in Auschwitz. Three of her siblings were killed in Auschwitz and she had two other siblings who died elsewhere. So in total, my grandmother lost seven immediate family members in the Holocaust. My grandfather had it a little easier, although not to say he had it easy, uh, but he was in a forced labor camp in Hungary, uh, but he lost everyone. And so his parents, his siblings. So when he came back, he had nothing. And, uh, you know, my book, since it's out there and there's been a lot of publicity, people have asked me, okay, your, your grandparents both survived, survived the Holocaust, your grandmother, maybe in a little more harrowing fashion than your grandfather, but when did they meet? And so the answer to that question is they met the day my grandmother got back. She had no clothes. All she had was a thin cotton dress and the blue overcoat that she was wearing during the cold winter months in Budapest. And so her brother, who, had, who, who was also home, uh, he said, we need to get you some clothes. I made a friend in the labor camp who just opened up a store nearby that sells clothes. Let's go get you some clothes. And that was my grandfather's store. And so the day my grandmother got back from the Holocaust, she walked uh, from surviving, she, she walked through my grandfather's doors into his store. Uh, as I tell my family story, of course, basketball is a big part of it. it it's very kind of interwoven through the generations. And so, you know, I, so we talk about what happened in the Holocaust, but for my grandparents, they then had to deal with more than a decade under communism in Romania, you know, and um, that my grandma still talks about how brutal that was. And so, my dad, who's, you know, again, a well-known sports figure in the United States, has no discernible accent. He was born in communist Romania. He was born in the same area of Transylvania where my grandparents are from. And so, you know, they, again, they, they still talk about how much anti-Semitism there were, how there was, there was no freedom. You couldn't speak against the government. Uh, you couldn't really speak against anything. You, you couldn't make a living, right? The work, work was not for you. Work was for other people. And so, as bad as the war was, you know, communism was also very tough for them. And so it took 10 years for them to be able to leave Romania. And I'll tell you why that's significant later on. You'll hear how long it took my dad to become an American citizen uh, because of his basketball ability. But my family got passports for Israel. It was the state of Israel that was willing to pay money for Jews to, to flee communism. And my, uh, my family was, was, were some of those people. And so one interesting thing I talk about in the book is that, you know, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you are familiar with the term chutzpah, right? Uh, my grandparents had that, they were survivors, you know, to, to persevere over that, to, to have that willpower, uh, they, they had guts. And so in order to have a life under communism, you had to transact on the black market. You know, that you just, there wasn't enough. You know, you, you would starve, there, there just wasn't enough. And so my grandfather was a very industrious guy. He, he knew how to kind of, you know, make a little extra money here and there. And so over a decade of kind of doing this business on the black market, my family was able to save up $1,000 worth of Romanian money and $4,000 worth of American dollars, which if you were caught with that money, you would be jailed, tortured or killed. But for my grandparents, again, who, who were survivors, 
they, you know, they, they took that risk and, and cause they, they knew we, we need this to build a life. And so when they got passports to leave Romania, they had to flee as refugees. They were now basically considered enemies of the state, right? They're not allowed to bring anything of value out of the country. And they said, well, we're going to get our money out, you know? And again, like, even if you were ever even caught with that money, you were in big, big trouble, let alone if you tried to smuggle that money out. And so they said, there's a way and we're, we're there's a way and we're going to find them. So, and no spoilers here, they got every cent out of the country and I'll tell you how. So for the Romanian money, my grandfather, you know, they were thinking and all of a sudden he, he, he thought of a plan. And so he had a lot of relationships in the community. He found out what train they would be leaving on. And so the night before they left in the middle of the night, pitch dark, he walked to the train station with a friend as lookout. He, he kind of finagled his way on board of the train that they were going to take to leave Romania. He had the Romanian money in his pocket and he hid it under a seat in front of the train. And so the next day, when my family boarded, my grandma still talks about how the communist officers frisked my dad, who was eight years old at the time. They patted him down, they got in their faces and they yelled, do you have anything of value? Do you have any money? And my grandmother said, we don't have anything on us. And she wasn't lying. The money was already on board. And so when they got on the train, my grandfather took his seat, they enjoyed the ride. And when they got to, to Italy, he let everyone disembark. He went to the front of the train, reached under the seat, took his money and went on his way. So that's how they smuggled the Romanian money out of the country. The American dollars were a lot more dangerous and a lot more risky. And, I, and my grandmother has stories of friends who were caught with Romanian, with American dollars and were put in jail for five years and tortured, right? So this is how communism was. So, but they said, we, we need to get this money out, right? This was, this was a fortune to them. And so you won't believe me when I tell you, but who here is familiar, anyone here familiar with Buddy Hackett? I'm sure I see a lot of hands going up. Buddy Hackett smuggled the money out of, out, of, uh, out of the country from my grandparents. Let me tell you how that happened. And, you know, one thing about my family story, you know, I don't know if you all know the movie Forrest Gump, right? It's a, it's a favorite movie of mine. And Forrest Gump's life is kind of in, in, weaving in and out of moments in history and characters in history that are very prominent. That's, that's my family story, right? There's Buddy Hackett. There's the Beatles. There's the son of Sam Killer from New York City. There's, of course, Adolf Eichmann and Raul Wallenberg and others. And so uh, let me tell you the, the Buddy Hackett story. And so, again, my grandparents had this money. They were, they were thinking, how could they get it out? And my grand, something dawned on my grandma. She said, well, my cousin in Budapest, is, uh, he's, a, he's working on a movie set. And Buddy Hackett is acting in this movie. And he's a big American star. He can do whatever he wants with money. So if my cousin will ask Buddy Hackett if he'll take the money out, maybe we have a chance. And sure enough, my grandmother's cousin approached Buddy Hackett. He said, we have some Holocaust survivors who need your help. Would you be willing to take their money out of the country? He didn't hesitate. He said, if you can get it to me, I'll bring it for them. And so how they got it from Romania to Budapest was another story that I tell in the book. My grandmother had to sew a false bottom into a suitcase. They had to have someone transported. These are, these are risky endeavors, but once the money hit Buddy Hackett's hand, it was no longer illegal. It belonged to an American celebrity who, by the way, at that point in time had been on the Tonight Show, I think roughly 80 times. Okay, so this is this is one of the biggest celebrities. And these are, you know, my, my uh, grandparents who survived the Holocaust and are now living under communism. But as I write in my book, worlds collide. And then we'll see that more as my family story progresses. Uh, Buddy Hackett took my family's money out of America, out of, out of Romania to America. He sent it to my great uncle who was already in the Bronx with an extra $50 on top, which in, in this time was like a thousand dollars, right? So that was a very generous thing that he did. And there was a note on top that said, good luck in America, sincerely Buddy Hackett. And, and again, that's an example of someone who just saw people who needed help and, and he gave them that help and he supported them. And so it was, it was with that money that my grand parents and my family built a life in America. And I'll tell you really the cherry on top of that story, about 25 to 30 years later, when my grandparents are in America, and actually it was 20 years later, uh, my dad was a big basketball star. My grandparents went to Las Vegas for vacation and they saw Buddy Hackett perform. He was a headliner. And at dinner that night, my, my grandma told the story of what he did. And one of her friends got up from the table. He went to the front desk. He talked his way 
into Buddy Hackett's suite. And he said, Buddy, we have those Holocaust survivors that you smuggled their money out there here. He said, bring them up. And so they spent the night together in Las Vegas, drinking liquor, reminiscing. Buddy Hackett's from Brooklyn, New York. My dad was a star for the New York Knicks. He knew of my dad. And so the, the whole story came full circle. Uh, when my family got to the United States, it was my grandparents, my dad, and his older brother. And so my older, my dad's older brother was, was eight years older. Uh, my dad had a name for him in, in Hungarian. That's their native language, which in English translates to my king. That's, that's how much he revered his older brother. Um, when they got to the United States, they were already living the American dream. They had an opportunity to make a life for themselves, to be safe. You know, those were things that they had never had before. Almost immediately upon arrival in the United States, my uncle was diagnosed with leukemia and he passed away within a year. And so this is probably the greatest tragedy of my family because to lose for my grandparents, to lose a son, for my dad, to lose a brother at such a young age, uh, it, it's just a, a terrible tragedy. And it's a hole that will never be filled. And I'm named after my uncle, his, his American, in American it's Leslie. And my name is Daniel Leslie Grunfeld after him. Uh, so that's the situation my dad found himself in. Son of Holocaust survivors, didn't speak a word of English when he got to America. He had never touched a basketball. And then his brother gets sick and passes away. And so what did he do? He's in Forest Hills, Queens in New York City. He went to the playground. That's what kids did in the city back in those days. And what do you do at the park? You play basketball. And so my dad started playing basketball to make friends, to learn English and, and to heal from the loss of his brother. In my book, which by the way, I'll hold up for you. This is it by the grace of the game. Um, I think it looks good the, the, the cover came out well. So I'm very excited about it. Um, you know, so my dad, you know, he was in this kind of disadvantaged position at an at, as an at-risk youth in America. And in my book, I talk a lot about privilege, right? Because all, all parents want are for their kids to have it better than them. And, and that's what grandparents want. And, you know, I, when I was, grew up, uh, my dad was a player for the Knicks. He was the, the general manager of the Knicks. I, I had it so much better. And my mom drove me to every game I played starting in second grade. My dad worked with me on my basketball skills. My sister came to all my games. For my dad, basketball was just something he did to get away from it all. And for my grandparents, they just looked at it as, as an outlet, as a great outlet for him. And my grandparents never saw my dad play basketball until he was a junior in high school, 17 years old. They opened up a fabric store in the Bronx. And again, Holocaust survivors, immigrants, they were work, work, work. And so they would never close their store early. But my dad's high school games were at 4 p.m., right? So one day at the store, they got a call from my dad's high school coach. And it was my grandmother answered. And he said, Mrs. Grunfeld, you have to see your son play basketball. He's special. My grandparents had no idea what was happening. And so one day the following week, they closed the store. But they didn't close it too early because, you know, because you can't, you know, you can't miss out too much business. So when they got to the gym, the game had already started and the doors were closed. And when they approached the usher, he said, sorry, the gym's full. We can't let you in. And their English wasn't very good. And so my grandfather tried to talk his way in. He said, we're, we're parents of player. We're guests of coach. And the usher said, nothing we can do. Sorry. And my grandmother kind of summoned her strength and her English. And she said, Ernie Grunfeld is our son. And the usher's eyes lit up and he said, well, why didn't you say so? He swung the door open. They entered the gym. Uh, you know, they had never been to one of his games. So they were kind of getting their bearings. And my grandfather, my grandma still, still tells the story. My grandfather was looking around and he nudged my grandma, you know, with his elbow and he whispered to her in Hungarian. He said, well, if he's so good, why isn't he playing? And my grandma looked at him in surprise and she said, you know, his name is in Hungarian, his name is Shunyi, and in English, it's Alex. And she said, Shunyi, look right there. That's Ernie. He was right in the middle of the court. My grandfather could not recognize his own son. He had almost literally transformed before his eyes from this little boy who had come to America, who had been through these hardships, to a powerful, imposing force. And my grandparents never saw it coming. And so at, that was the first time, again, that they saw him. Uh, my grandfather always every Saturday made my dad come to the fabric store to work. And on the floor after that game, my grandfather told my dad, you never come to the store again. You just play basketball and we'll take care of the rest. And so roughly a year after they saw my dad play for the first time, he was already an all American. He was one of the highest recruited players in the country. 
uh, he had his pick. He chose to go to the University of Tennessee. At that time, great players from New York City went down south, and that's what he did. At Tennessee, he was a four-time All-SEC player. He was the SEC Player of the Year. He teamed with Bernard King, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, Bernard King is an NBA Hall of Famer. He led the league in scoring. Uh, my dad and Bernard King formed one of the greatest duos in college basketball history. They were called the Ernie and Bernie Show. They were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Uh, Bernard King was from Brooklyn. My dad was from Queens. One season, they each averaged more than 25 points per game. So I know there's some basketball fans in here. Think about that at the college level for two players to each average more than 25 a game, right? It, it was unbelievable what they did, what they did uh, on the basketball court at Tennessee. When my dad graduated, he was the leading scorer in the history of the University of Tennessee and the second leading scorer in the history of the SEC. And so that was in 1977. It's obviously 2021 today. My dad at this very moment is the fifth leading scorer in the history of the SEC. So all these years later, all those points he scored are still, are still right up there at the top of the leaderboard. And this is the kid that I was just talking about 15 minutes ago who came to America, who didn't speak English, who lost his brother, you know, who, who kind of rose out of, the, out of the ashes of the Holocaust. So this is why I wrote the book. And in my, you know, my subtitle is The Holocaust, A Basketball Legacy and an Unprecedented American Dream. It is unprecedented. You know, it's never happened before. And I'll tell you one of the most remarkable things about the story is my dad's junior year at Tennessee, he had the opportunity to try out for the United States Olympic team. So you could imagine, you could imagine the pride that my grandparents felt. Could, I mean, not in their wildest dreams, you know, coming from the Holocaust to have their son become an Olympian. But before I tell you about the Olympics, let me tell you about his first USA basketball experience because it links to something I said earlier. He, had, he played, he was invited to play for the national team and he represented the United States internationally. Um, and I see, I think we have a question here. So let me, let me t finish this one story and then maybe Danny, you can help me with this question. Um, so he, he played for, for the national team and towards the end of practice, the coach said, okay, we're gonna go overseas soon. Please bring your passports. And my dad went up to him afterwards and said, listen, I, I'll bring my green card. They said, well, wait, what about your passport? He said, I, I don't have a passport. They said, well, are you, are you an American citizen? This is Team USA. He said, well, not officially. And so uh, they, they couldn't believe it. And, but eventually they found out that since he was in the United States for more than 10 years, he was, in, he was eligible for his passport. So the, these practices were in Providence, Rhode Island. They flew him to Washington, D.C. All his papers were filled out. 24 hours later, he was back at practice with his pa United States passport in hand. So I write in the book that it took my grandparents more than a decade to leave Romania for the United States. It took my dad 24 hours to become a citizen because of his, his scoring ability on the basketball court. And I want to tell you about the experience with the Olympics, but let me pause there. Danny, is there, is there a question or two? Yeah, there's, a, there's several questions. Uh, there's a comment. One of, our, <clears throat> one of our participants said, I saw the Ernie and Bernie show at St. John University gym. They were great. But SJU won. As I recall, all the That's refs true. wore red and white striped shirts that night. <laughs> nice, nice. Hey, it's in New York City, right? Um, that's true. They, they did lose to St. John's, but thank you for calling that out. I mean, yeah, the Ernie and Bernie show was, was a phenomenon. It's, it's interesting because I've connected with a lot of people in Knoxville because of the book. And they said, Dan, you think you know, but you have no idea. And they, they call it Ernie G mania, you know, which my dad and I laugh about, right? But uh, he was... He was a phenomenon. And, and again, he was a solid NBA player, but he was a legendary high school and college player. And so I'm thank you for whoever made that comment. And uh, yeah, the, the refs were obviously in St. John's favor that night. So a question was, <clears throat> is uh, was there a three point shot in effect when your dad played? Maybe that's why some players passed him in total points. <laughs> you know, there, there wasn't. There wasn't a three point shot. Um, I, you know what? So some players passed him just because that's what happened. But, you know, my dad stays four years. And now when players are, you know, very good in scoring as much as my dad did, they have a chance to make millions of dollars right away. So a lot of them have left the NBA. So if every, left for the NBA. So if every player still stay, stayed for four years, likely players might have passed him. But I think his, his place in the history books is pretty safe because if you're averaging 20, 25 points a game in college, you're not staying very long nowadays. Um, and interestingly, I said that when he, 
graduated from Tennessee. He was the second leading scorer in the history of the SEC. My dad's year was one of the first where college players played as freshmen. Prior to him, they played freshman basketball. So they did. So their their totals didn't count. But the the leading scorer in the history of the conference only played three years. But it was Pistol Pete Maravich, and he averaged forty four points per game at LSU. Right. So <laughs> in three years, he was and to this day he's the leading scorer in the history of the conference in in three years. So and I'm a big Pistol Pete fan. So I'm always happy to share that tidbit. That's a, that's awesome. Um, so another question. And I actually have a question too, but I'll ask this one first. Did your dad or your grandparents experience anti-Semitism? For instance, did your dad in college experience the anti-Semitism? So he's he experienced anti-Semitism throughout his life, certainly under communism and at other points and at other points in time. People ask that a lot because you know it's Knoxville, Tennessee, right? It's down right. south. But right. according to my dad, they treated him beautifully. If, if it was around him, he didn't feel it. And maybe that was because of his just intense focus on basketball and also how beloved he was. I mean, he was larger than life, you know? So there weren't many people at the time saying many things uh, against Ernie Grunfeld in Tennessee. Uh, but I'll tell you, Bernard King, you know, who's a black man from, from Brooklyn, he, he has spoken publicly about the racism that he felt in Knoxville. But for my dad at Tennessee, uh, he, he, he didn't feel much of it. And actually, you know what, I do want to pause the questions because I want to make sure I tell this Olympic story in some other context, and then I want to open it up more broadly to the sure. discussion. Is that, is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mentioned, you know, I, my dad, you know, got his, his passport in, in short order because of his scoring ability. And then he, was, he had the opportunity to try out for the United States Olympics team. Uh, that was 1976 in Montreal. If, for those historians out there, 1972 was the year that the gold medal was robbed from the United States team led by Doug Collins. Uh, it was also the year it was in Munich, right? So the massacre of the 11 Israeli Olympians. And so for many reasons, the 76 Olympics were significant. You know, America wanted to bring back the gold, certainly. And so Dean Smith from the University of North Carolina was the coach of the team. John Thompson from Georgetown was the assistant. So this was a very prominent cast of characters. And again, my dad had the opportunity to try out. There was about 65 or 70 players at the tryouts. And of course, only 12 make it. And my dad was one of them. And so my grandparents got the opportunity to close their fabric store for two weeks now. They drove from Queens, New York to Montreal, Canada, and they watched their son who had come to America, not speaking English, having never touched a basketball, losing his brother, become a gold medalist for the United States of America. And so I, to this day, have a panoramic picture of the opening ceremonies of the 1976 Olympics on the wall of my hallway. And it hung in my grandmother's apartment for 35 years. And so that's such a symbolic moment for my family. It's such a testament to what sports can do for you, you know, taking families around the world. And, and so that was an incredibly meaningful and meaningful experience. And so my dad was the 11th pick in the NBA draft. By the way, Bernard King was the seventh. And uh, my dad and I laughed because when he was at Tennessee, pro scouts would come and they would they would say, well, Bernard's really good, but Ernie's really good. I don't know who you'd rather take. And uh, so as rookies in the NBA, my dad averaged about six and a half points a game, a few rebounds. Bernard King averaged 24 points a game and nine rebounds. So, there was, a, you know, he he continued to blossom. And my dad was a very, very solid role player. But Bernard King was really a star. And so my dad had a very you know solid, successful nine year NBA career. Interestingly, when he retired, his first job with the New York Knicks was to broadcast Knicks games on the radio. He was he was part of the broadcast team. When my dad came to America, my grandparents wanted him to go to a yeshiva in the Bronx, and they denied him admittance because he couldn't speak English. So, you know, th that, that just shows you, you know, all these years later, he was announcing Knicks games on the radio, you know. So uh, that, that that's kind of speaks to the evolution and, and the transformation. He quickly rose in the front office, became an NBA executive. You know, so he was, as Danny mentioned, general manager of the Knicks, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Washington Wizards. So he had this storybook career, but very few people know this history. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons my book is doing quite well and it's resonating a lot. Not only is it an important human story, right, to, to understand, you know, what, what is at stake when people aren't treated fairly, but then also you know, what hope and positivity and perseverance can do for people. And so for all those reasons, I think 
this story have has given people something to believe in. For my whole life, it's given me something to believe in. And the way my book is structured is it alternates between this story I've just told you of my grandparents and my dad and my own story with basketball. And, you know, I, I grew up with advantages, with privilege, uh, and I was so driven and motivated by the history that I've just kind of conveyed to you, you know, and it was almost like an obligation for me to succeed as a basketball player. And so, um, you know, I definitely talk about my journey getting to Stanford and having a successful basketball career in my own right, you know, playing in Germany my first year, right? And I say in the book, I'm probably the only professional basketball player who had to ask his grandmother's permission to sign his first contract, right? Because my opportunity was in Germany. And so I called her and I said, Anya, I have, a, I have an opportunity to start my professional career, but it's in Germany. And she said, well, what's the problem? I said, well, I, I thought you might not be okay with that. And I'll never forget what she said. She calls me Tatala, you know, and she said, Tatala, sons are not responsible for the sins of their fathers, you know, which is such an amazing testament to her perspective. You know, she said, this generation didn't do what their ancestor generations did. And that's, that's how people looked at Jews. You know, people blamed us for things and didn't treat us fairly and said, we, we cannot do that to anyone else. And so I went to Germany. I had a great experience there. You know, I, with my team, we, we drove by the, the site of the Nuremberg rallies. We went to the Holocaust uh, Memorial in Berlin. You know, so for me, it was kind of a, a reconciliation and a, and a coming to terms with that history. Uh, you know, and, and I mentioned how close my, I am with my grandma and, and her coming to all my games at Stanford, you know, that this history has just always driven me again and motivated me so much. And it's been a, you know, an obligation, like I said, and that was always kind of, it manifested in me trying to make the NBA, you know, and I had this very successful college career. Uh, I had a crushing knee injury at Stanford where I tore my ACL at the very end of the season when I was the second leading scorer in the conference. It really changed my trajectory, but had a successful professional career, but never made it to the NBA. Uh, I, I did go to training camp with the New York Knicks, which was serendipitous, of course, because my dad, you know, came to America and, and watched Nick games from the bleachers as an immigrant trying to learn English. And then he played for the team and then he was running the team. And if there are any Nick fans here, if you're no Dave DeBusher, uh, he, he's a Hall of Fame player. He was my dad's favorite player. Very hard nosed, scrappy, tough guy. That's how my dad modeled his game, who he modeled it after. So if you ever go watch a basketball game at the University of Tennessee, you'll see the number 22 in the rafters. That's my dad's number. It's retired. And he, my dad wore number 22 for Dave DeBusher from the New York Knicks. And so I had the chance to, to go to training camp with the Knicks and I was cut. Uh, I, I, one of the last people cut and, you know, I, I made my career overseas and finished in Israel, uh, which is also a, a, an incredibly meaningful experience for, for me, given how much my family uh, ended up there. Uh, my dad and I both played in the Maccabea games in Israel, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And it's funny because in 1973, when my dad was a high school senior, they won the silver medal in Israel in the Maccabea games. In 2009, when I was already a professional player, uh, we won the gold medal. So my dad might have an Olympic gold medal, but I have a Maccabea games gold medal. And I, I remind him of that. So uh, listen, I, again, my one thing I want to just highlight, right? Here's my book right here. And you see the title, By the Grace of the Game. Hopefully with the story that I just have told you, you understand why I called it that. Basketball was heaven sent for my family. You know, it, it, it came out of nowhere and it saved my dad when he, when he needed something, you know, where his brother had passed his, you know, his, his parents were working six, seven days a week. He was a latchkey kid in New York city. Here comes a game of basketball. And, uh, you know, with all the injustice, with all the prejudice, with all the inequality that my family has faced, basketball doesn't know what language you, the, the basketball, the ball itself doesn't know what language you speak doesn't know where you're from, doesn't know what color your skin is, doesn't know what your religion is. And it's such a powerful uniter. And I found that, of course, in my life, in my career, my dad with his career, but just the journey, you know, and, and, how, and how the game still links, links these generations together. And so uh, one other thing I'll mention about my book, and then I definitely want to answer questions and have a conversation. The foreword of my book was writ is written by Ray Allen. Uh, many of you probably know Ray Allen. He is a Hall of Fame NBA basketball player, recently named one of the top 75 players in NBA history. So think about that. Essentially, he's one of the 75 best players ever to touch a basketball. Uh, Ray wrote the foreword for my book. 
my dad was a general manager of the Milwaukee Bucks when Ray was a young player. And uh, so we have a relationship and people know about Ray as an amazing basketball player. But what few people know is he was on the board of the Holocaust Museum appointed by President Obama. He saw Schindler's List when he was in college. He visited the museum when he was a young pro. And he said, this is not just a Jewish tragedy. This is a human tragedy. And so he's made it his mission to educate about on the Holocaust. He, every time his teams played in Washington, D.C., he took teammates to the museum. He's been to Auschwitz, where my great grandparents were killed. And so I, I tell people for as great of a, a basketball player as he was, he's an even better human being. And so it's been in, incredible to see that type of support. And I have, you know, if you grab the book, you'll, you'll see the back cover. There are quotes by NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, CNN's Wolf Blitzer, Nancy Lieberman, one of the greatest female players, uh, Bernard King, of course, who I mentioned. And so for me to have the support of these people uh, standing by this story, it, it just means the world because this is my, you know, our version of a very familiar story, you know, of overcoming adversity, ha you know, persevering, loving your family, you know, passing down your values. And so that's really what this book is about. And so uh, it's been so nice to be able to, to talk to you all about it today. I want to open it up to questions. Maybe Danny, you can help and we can have a, a bit of a conversation about it. But thank you all for, for listening to the story. That's absolutely fabulous. So I do have, we still have some questions and then, um, and then, yeah, we can open it up. So uh, first of all, a uh, fellow member of my school up here in Newton, uh, writes in that his parents were survivors from Hungary. Listen to this. And he was a grad student at University of Tennessee from 1975 to 1979. And he attended a Passover Seder with your dad. Oh, that's amazing. And he very much regrets that he didn't know his Hungarian background because they could have chatted. So how's that? So when we have these webinars, I, I happen to send them out, not just to the men's club, but we all send out to our network. So Eugene and I have known each other for a long time. And so perhaps I'll give Eugene your email and you guys can connect because I think that would be, uh, that's fascinating. It's a small, small world. So I, I, I would I, I would love that. And hello, Eugene. And that's that's tremendous. Thank you for sharing that. And please reach out. That's amazing. I will be happy to do that. Um, so someone let to know, since you played in Germany, did you learn any German? And since you played in Israel, did you learn any Hebrew? I, I wish the answer was better. So uh, essentially, no, right? I mean, I, I picked up words here and there. German, it, I was less interested in learning because I was younger and there was less of a connection. Hebrew, I wanted to learn. And, uh, you know, but my coaches spoke in English. A lot of my teammates were American. And I, I really regret that I didn't learn more of the language. I, I picked up things, of course, hearing it. And I write about this in the book. For me, hearing Hungarian is, is comforting in a way, because that's the language that I grew up hearing my, my dad and grandma speak still to this day. I heard them today speaking Hungarian with each other. Uh, they're, they're similar for Hebrew, you know, and Israel, again, it, it all relates to the history. Like, Israel opened up its arms to families like mine after the Holocaust, you know, and so I, and I write about this very kind of candidly in the book. When I first got to Israel for the Maccabea games, I, I quickly realized that it, it, it is my home, you know, because I am a Jew and Israel is there to protect Jews and, and we need it, you know, and, and we've needed it throughout history. And so uh, for that reason, my, my kind of connection to, to, to the state, uh, I, 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 the language, means a lot to me but i wish i spoke it more it's okay so um our regional president of our connecticut region first of all was very excited he put yukon in his chat so he <laughs> wanted to, um, but he has a question and it was actually something i was going to ask you too so i'm going to combine the two questions together uh that you you mentioned that your family got a visa to go to israel how did they land up in the united states and my question is why did they stay after the war? Why didn't they get the yeah. hell out and go either to Palestine or to the US? So that, that's my question and Phil's question combined in one. I'm gonna answer your, your question first. So, and, I, and I've asked my grandma that because other people have asked it. Why you know, so many Jews fled Europe, why didn't you? And I asked my grandma and she said, you know, right after the war, uh, 
you know, I met your grandpa, we got married right away and we had a baby. And that was my uncle, you know, who passed away. And she said, once we started a family, you know, we, we, we had these roots here, whether or not, you know, the soil was uh, sour or not, you know, that's where the roots were. And so they, they just said they started their family. And so that, that's really what kept them there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that I don't think there are any regrets because that that's why you do things, you know, that you, you make decisions for your kids. And so that's, uh, that's why, that's why they did that uh, regarding how they were bound for Israel and then ended up in, in the United States. So my grandfather wanted to go to the States because he heard that's where the opportunity was. My grandmother wanted to go to Israel because that's where her family was. My uncle was dating a girl in Romania who went to the United States. And so he wanted to go to the United States. And my grandma said, very honestly, I say no to your grandfather, but I couldn't say no to my son. And so they, they, were, they were looking for a way. And if you know uh, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, they helped my family come to America. They, they enacted their help. They were able to, they said, if you can, my, when they left Romania, my family spent six months in Rome as refugees. And so when they were in Rome, they were able to, to work to get to America and they were, they did it. Great. That's great. So you'll like this question. So now you wrote a book. So now someone wants to know, has anyone approached you or your dad about doing a movie of your family story? Uh, yes, which is very cool. Uh, <laughs> I think I think people are understanding that this is a it's a unique story. And by the way, like I, I said, like you can't write this. I tried, you know, I, I tried to, but you couldn't make it up, right? Because it just this is how it happened. This is how it happened. But it's so unlikely. It's so improbable. I think that there's been a lot of attention, not only on the book, but of adapting the book to tell this story in different formats, because it's such a universal story. It really is. You know, it, it's a story of survival. It's a story of love. It's a story of perseverance. And more than anything, it's a story of hope. You know, it, it's a hopeful story. And, and I say that all the time when I'm speaking about the book, that there are a lot of hard things discussed in it. And my grandma always says, just because the story is hard doesn't mean you shouldn't tell it. You know, and I have to tell hard stories in this book because, you know, listen, my, my, my ancestors were killed in Auschwitz. You know, my uncle passed away young, tragically. These are things we have to talk about. But at the end of the day, my, you know, the game of basketball was so kind of important to my family and the love that we've all had is, you know, we've had, thank God, full, rich, fulfilling lives. And so I think that it's, it's a story really of hope. And so for that reason, I, we have been approached, we're having conversations it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's been, it's been a whirlwind, you know, with the book coming out and it's, you know, people being so interested in it is, it's very, of course, flattering, humbling, and just exciting. You know, I, and uh, I'll tell you all this, I didn't write the book to be a commercial vehicle. In fact, to, for, to do a book like this, you're supposed to put a proposal together about what you want the book to be, then get an agent, then sell it to a publisher, and then write the book. Uh, but I, I talked to a few mentors of mine, some professors of mine at Stanford, and they said, and I've done a lot of writing over the course of my life, and I've had some nice success with it. They said, you can write. The story means the world to you. Just write the book. And that's what I did. I just wrote it, and then we figured the rest out. So that's all to say that I just wrote this from the heart because it really matters to me, and I hope that the story can kind of inspire and impact others. And if that becomes a movie, it'd be the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so uh, that's great. Uh, a few more questions. I. Uh... My uh, good friend and neighbor, Steve, has a question. Uh, literally, he's my neighbor. He's up the block. Uh -huh. Did you say your friend had a connection to the Beatles or was that just an expression of how your family story is that like Forrest Gump? Because you also, I heard you say son of Sam. So just to, to be, uh, I'm, I'm up here in Newton, but I grew up in a big, as a big Dave DeBusher and Bradley. I mean, I was, I grew up as a big Knicks fan. So with, when you say Dave DeBusher, it's like, yeah, that yeah. whole team was, you know, so that's my background as well. So anyway, so do you actually have a connect? Did you have a connection to the Beatles and to all that? Or you're just being metaphorical? Yeah. No, no, it's, it's in there. It's in the book. I'll, um, oh, then don't there, tell us. I'm not up to that part. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, only up to page a, 77. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Well, no, listen, the, I will say the connection, The be it, it's a passing kind of, it's about kind of meandering in and out of history, right? And so the Beatles, they just, they kind of show, it's not as, as intimate as the Buddy Hackett story, which is like real, you know, Direct. real interaction, right? But, uh, 
and and so, yeah, the son of Sam murders are they're tied to the story as well. And uh, I grew up hearing about these things, you know, and so I thought it was important to yeah to weave it in and out of the book. And by the way, about DeBusher, real quick, when my dad was signed by the New York Knicks in 1982 as a free agent, and DeBusher was their general manager who signed my dad. So again, after he watched him and that. admired him and wore his number, it was then DeBusher who brought him to the Knicks. That's awesome. So I, um, you don't talk that much. You haven't talked that much about yourself. You're being very humble. As you said, you play basketball. What are you doing now besides writing books and going to be the next big movie star? Yeah. Um, so I played professionally for eight seasons. So I retired in 2014. I was a very good student as an undergrad at Stanford. And actually, again, linked to my family. My, my grandmother was someone who is still, but as a youth, was someone who loved to learn, loved to read. She, she said, I, I love school. All my, all my peers said that they hated going to school. I love going to school. And because of the war, because of the Holocaust, she wasn't able to get her education. So for me, you know, I had the opportunity to go to Stanford University. I, I was going to make the most of that, you know. And so I was a two-time academic All-American there. I did very well. And so after I graduated, I, and I, I write this in the book, my last year playing professional basketball, I studied harder for my GMAT, which is the test to get admitted to business school. Uh, I studied harder on the test than I did work on my basketball skills, and it showed. I did not do very well on the court, but I did really well on the test. And so I got into Stanford again, and I got my MBA there, joined a startup, which we grew, and now I work at a venture capital firm. Um, so I, I help startups grow and scale, and that's my day job, and I enjoy what I do. And I'm, you know, after you play basketball for so long, you have to build a new career. And so I'm just fortunate to have gone to Stanford and to have a that that good kind of network and education. But uh, so definitely focused on my career, but focused on the book as well, particularly in, in the last you know few weeks and in this last week when it's now out. And you live, you know, well, I know where you live, but where do you, do you live on the West Coast, correct? Yeah, I live in the Bay Area. So actually about 10 minutes from Stanford's campus, so in Menlo Park. So if you hear about Silicon Valley and we're, we're right in the heart of it. Wow, very good. Okay, well, um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so do we, we can open up if anyone has any questions. Feel free to uh, type along or you can unmute yourself. It's fine at this point. Yeah, please, I mean, yeah, please unmute and, and uh, if there's any comments or questions or anything at all, I'm, I'm grateful for you all spending the time. I hope you'll consider, you know, grabbing a copy of the book. Uh, one thing that's cool about the book people have said is that, you know, kids should get this for their parents, but parents should get this for their kids or grandkids or the, the whole thing. And so uh, I hope that some of you will consider doing that. What's your dad I, doing now? You said, what's he doing or how's he doing or both? What's he, what's he doing now? Yeah, my, so my dad, his last year with the Washington Wizards was in 2019. So he spent roughly 30 years as an executive. He lives in, in the DC area. That's where my sister is with her family. And so he's enjoying being a grandfather. Uh, he still is connected to the game. You know, there are people that he he helps and, you know, he's kind of engaged with, but he's not officially with a team. He's certainly not officially running a team, which, you know, after all that time, I'm happy for him to have a little space because there's a ton of pressure. And I write a lot about this in the book, you know, me for me growing up and my dad being the GM of the Knicks, that it's a hard job. There's a lot of pressure with that. And we're all, I think with a lot of sports fans here, you know, you know how demanding that that occupation can be. So yeah, he's just kind of enjoying, you know, being a grandfather. Did, did you did you happen to know the Poland family from from the uh, what DC area? A, 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 yeah, of course, a, Mr. Mr. Poland is may he rest in peace. Was an amazing man. So he hired my dad to be the general manager of the Wizards and president of the Wizards. He he was my dad was very close with him so, and so Irene. He, what, yeah, Irene was a good, a very good friend of mine. Oh, that, yeah, she's lovely, your, the best people. She just passed away a couple of years. She did. Ago. But anyway, so was your father involved with the, with in Washington when Abe fired the Michael Jordan as the as the was he involved in that that uh, that episode when he was the assistant Michael Jordan was the assistant coach or something like that never showed up. So. My dad was only involved because he replaced Michael Jordan. And so Michael oh. Jordan was the president of the team. And Abe Poland, you know, pretty famously let him go, which, you know, to let Michael Jordan go in basketball is, is a very gutsy thing to do. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so, 
Yeah, and my, my dad replaced him. So my dad became the president of basketball operations after Michael Jordan. And let me tell you one more thing for the group about Abe Poland, who again was the owner of the Washington Wizards, the Washington Capitals. The, the, the team in Washington used to be called the Washington Bullets, you know, and when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. Yeah, changed the name. Yeah. Abe Poland changed the name. He said, we can't stand by something that took a dear friend of mine and a pillar of, you know, <laughs> the Jewish community know around the world. Yep, and so... Yeah. That that was the and of course, listen, if you read about this event, there was gun violence in the area itself. So there was, you know, you could link it to many reasons, but it was it was when Yitzhak Ravine was killed. That's why he changed the name of Bullets so, to the Wizards. So did your dad ever talk about race relations in the NBA when he was playing? And, and because the, the I was a rabid Knicks fan, I was from Brooklyn and the Knicks were a model of, of where the black and white players, you know, they made it. The Br Bradley DeBusher with Don Frank Rauer, with yeah. Willis Reed, that was an incredible team. And they owned New York. That 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 New York fell in love with those guys. Uh, and, oh, and man. the model for race relations in terms of what the, what they what they did and how they played together. But was the black-white thing a big issue for your dad or anti-Semitism and that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, first of all, regarding that team, you're 100% right. And, you know, Red Holtzman, of course, the, the legendary coach, uh, Jew from Brooklyn himself, was like a grandfatherly figure to me. You know, he was my dad's mentor. But they were all one. And that's what, about the game, right? That's what the game does. And so for my dad, you know, my dad, my, you know, it's not, it's never a race thing. It's just a human thing. You know, it's the game, again, the ball doesn't lie. You know, you, you play basketball, you you make friends. And it's pretty cool. Like I mentioned, Bernard King is, is a black man from Brooklyn. My dad's a, a white man from, from Queens. To this day, they're dear friends. You know, my dad was just visiting me and my wife in the Bay Area. He stepped outside for about a half hour. He came back in. I said, hey, man, wh where were you? He goes, oh, Bernard just called. I was talking to B. You know, like it, they're so... No, that honestly, like basketball is just a connector. You know, it's just a way for different races, different ethnicities, different religions to come together. My dad's part of that story too. He was a Jewish guy playing in the NBA. You know, my dad finished his career with the Knicks and he wore number 18. And we know in, in Judaism, right? 18 is high. And so that's my dad's, you know, that every, you know, we all have kind of our individual wow. identities and that was my dad. So I think for him, basketball was always the, the connector, bringing people together. Happy Hanukkah. Do you have any fun Hanukkah stories for your fam from your family uh, all getting together? Fun Hanukkah stories. I think that Hanukkah was always, you know, we always celebrated in my house. As I've gotten older, you know, it's been less about presence and more about ritual and tradition. So listen, these are not like, these are not breaking news things, but we ate our latkes. We lit our candles. We said our prayers. And someone asked me recently about, you know, Hanukkah traditions. And yeah, it's just, and we're doing it with my son now, you know, lighting the candles and saying the prayers. And so I can't say that, that there are any, you know, memories that are above and beyond what you'd expect from a Jewish family se celebrating Hanukkah together. But we, we certainly did that every year and continue to do it. It's, so how old you know, are your kids? Your current? I, I have a two and a half year old son and we have another one on the way due in April. <laughs> okay. So they're very, very young. Because yeah. in your book, I will share, you you weren't exactly excited about becoming a bar mitzvah. So much so that <laughs> you had to get a home, you had to get a tutor. Uh, it's a great story. I won't be, I won't do the whole spoiler thing. Um, well, so, it, it is a very funny story. And I, and I was very focused on basketball. And so not that I, I, I really love my Jewish identity and it meant a lot to me. And we but, can see you that. Know, yeah, yeah, it, it does. But uh, I had practice. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be a big time player. And so sitting in Hebrew school was hard for me. But we, bar, you know, got the bar mitzvah done. And uh, yeah, we won't spoil that story. But hopefully you'll pick up the book and read it. It's a funny one. Did you ever cross paths with Tamir Goodman? Dear friend of mine. Tamir is the best. Um, do, do you know Tamir? Well, we no, know Tamir. So he uh, did a broadcast for us. So Dan, so. if you remember, we were chatting. Terrific. And oh, I was yeah, throwing out yeah. all those names to you. And that's actually a great segue into uh, to my conclusion here with you. So you were absolutely fabulous. What a great story. Um, it's more than a bit, much more, much, much more than a basketball story. Um, as I shared with you, I am a son of a, of a Holocaust survivor. So uh, the struggles of my mother coming to Jackson Heights, Queens in 1945, not speaking a word of English and 
trying to fit in as a refugee, you know, I can relate to it personally and your whole success. But more than even just that, who we've had as guests are all your good friends. You guys are like all connected. You're all <laughs> yeah. connected. As a matter of fact, on February 10th, Josh Halleckman, the sports radio <laughs> guy in Israel, is going to be one of our speakers, just like you. And you guys are good friends, he told me. We are. The sports rabbi. Uh, the sports Josh, rabbi. Josh, as In fact, Josh wrote an article about my book that was just released today in the Jerusalem Post. Josh is, he's a friend. Tamir is a good friend. Uh, he's an inspiration. And so, listen, the, the Jewish, you know, basketball community is tight knit. You know, and we all know this, like we're, you all here are congregating together. The Jewish community is tight knit and it needs to be. And, and honestly, my book kind of illustrates why, what has happened to us throughout history. And people ask, what does your grandma say about, you know, preventing this from happening again? And how do you remember it? And I, part of that is the community, us sticking with each other, you know, because we have each other. And so, Yes, we need allies. We need support from others, but you know we, we have to we have to always have strong Jewish communities. So we also had Tal Brody. We've had uh, uh, another friend of mine. I know. It's, so you guys. Uh, so it's just fabulous. It's fabulous that you were able to join us, particularly um, three days after your book's release. Um, so I think I shared with you. Um, I am the general manager of the Harvard Group up here in Cambridge. We have it on order, but it hasn't shipped yet. I, I know. It in. <laughs> so the, the supply chain issues are are really <laughs> tough, and also it's and Danny, you're in the book business. It's a good problem to have where it's selling a lot, which is really <laughs> awesome. Like people are super in, interested and they're buying it, so that's good. But at the same time, you know, we, we want to make sure we get in book the books in people's hands, and so I hope that people have patience and continue to order it. And for you on the phone uh, on this call again, I'll hold it up. Uh, this is my book. I'm so proud of it. And uh, it was just really an honor to be able to share the story with you all. I know we, there are many shared experiences for all of us and shared backgrounds. And so when I get a chance to talk to a group like this, it's particularly meaningful. You know, so, only in a call like this, do I hear about someone having a uh, Passover dinner with my dad in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1975. So I, I love these types of experiences. So it's our tradition that um, you'll email me a, a charity and we would love to make a donation because this is you're doing this for, on your dime for free. And we'd like to make a donation on your behalf to the charity of your choice. You can uh, send that to me on email um, because we really, really, really appreciate your time. Um, as I um, uh, advertised uh, unabashedly. Uh, we have several other, uh, thanks to my partner, David Kravitz, we have several other uh, sports webinars scheduled. We have um, January 24th, uh, Peggy Shukar, who is from the ADL, and she's going to talk to us about anti-Semitism and sports. Uh, I already mentioned to you about Josh on February 10th. And then we have a really interesting one on February 22nd, we have Rabbi Shira Rosenblum. Now, most of you, including myself, probably never heard of Rabbi Shira Rosenblum. She's a conservative rabbi in Jacksonville, Florida, but she's also a gold medal winner at the Maccabee Games for archery. What a great story. She tried out for the Brandeis Choir and didn't get in, and she was pissed off and she wanted to do something else with her free time and she took up archery and she's going to tell us all about that. So we have some cool stuff uh, planned going forward. Um, we're going to be together in Los Angeles. Um, this is another blatant advertiser on my part uh, on uh, uh, March 31st through April 3rd. And if you're in the neighborhood, it's hey, it's on the West Coast. We would love to have you join us at AJU. So I'll send you some of that as well. So anyway, uh, great turnout tonight. We had close to 60 screens, which means we probably had 100 people watching you. Uh, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Tom Sudo, because it was Tom's idea uh, in the first place to contact you, and we will stay in touch. And uh, Yeshiva University, number one in D mm -hmm. Division Three. It's, it's there true. You go. Mac, it's, we're, we're rooting for him. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much, Dan. Good night, Thank everyone. you to the group. It was really a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye.